reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to Psalm 96, God's Judgment. Psalm 96, a song of praise to God who is coming in judgment. God is going to judge in righteousness and truth when the Lord returns and starts his millennial kingdom. And I think the lesson for us might be that we should allow God to reign in righteousness and truth in our hearts today. No need to wait for the millennium, because wherever Jesus is really is the millennium, isn't it, in fact? And so may that millennial blessing be yours as he reigns in you in righteousness and truth. And as always, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, and we are so grateful to read about your word. We look forward to what we're going to hear. Please prepare our hearts, Father, for the reading of the word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, Let's begin with Psalm 96 and verse 1 as we see a praise for God's majesty. Uh, And let's read through the whole psalm. Kelly's going to read that and we're going to then talk about it. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Let all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. So this is God's judgment coming when the Lord returns. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. So in verse 1, the psalmist is saying, sing to the Lord a new song. New in the sense that God has done new things in your life. It can be an old song that's been sung countless times, but every time you sing it, it's new because it's fresh. And it means so much to you. But you know, you could also do a new song. When I first got saved, I used to just spend Saturday morning just walking around praising God and creating songs. Not worrying about the rhyme, just saying, thank you, Lord, for today. I appreciate all you're doing. Hallelujah. And let him give you the tune. Let him, the, words, the words are what's important, just to praise him and worship him. He wants to hear from us a new song in our hearts. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Well, right now we don't see all the earth singing to the Lord, but we are going to see it when he returns. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. You know, we use the expression, the good news, and we use the expression salvation, and they're both mentioned here in this line. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. There's so much bad news out there. 
it's good to have good news. And if you are, uh, I'm declaring right now a, a temporary fast from the news. I just don't really want to hear it as far as the world's news. And I've been very peaceful and I really enjoy this uh, sabbatical. And uh, I don't know who's doing what to whom and why, but uh, I'm getting into the good news and loving that. So the good news of his salvation. The word salvation, which uh, it really comes down in the Greek to the name Jesus, the Lord is salvation, really means welfare, prosperity, deliverance, healing, blessing, all of the aspects of God's salvation. Wonderful deliverance. And we are to declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. Years ago, mother and dad and I were down at the island of St. Martin worshiping the Lord. And I was out on the beach worshiping the Lord and mother was at a different part of the beach worshiping. And I received a sevenfold prophecy to leave the law practice and start a ministry. Mother was getting her own compatible revelation from God. And she said, when you go back, you're going to start a church and you're going to go on the radio. You're going to proclaim the good news on the radio and you're going to start a Bible institute. And so we merged those two prophecies and came back and we started within a matter of six months uh, this church and uh, we got on the radio soon thereafter in 1989 and we've been on the radio ever since proclaiming God's word. We're on television, we're on the, the, uh, on the uh, YouTube and Facebook and all the other different channels uh, and many ministries are doing that. They're proclaiming the good news around the world. So that's one way to do it. Another way is to just tell somebody about Jesus. That person standing next to you, that's just as viable a ministry, just as important, and probably in the long run even more effective. Because if people will do that, they're going to reach more people than all the proclaiming on the social media and in the uh, other media aspects. Just get out there and tell someone about Jesus. So let's read verse 4 and talk about his his reign, uh, well, let's, let's talk about his majesty a little bit more. Verse 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Why should we praise God? Why should we adore him, love him, follow him? He's great. Verse 4, the Lord is great, and he's greatly to be praised. So think about the greatness of God, and then think about the level of praise that we have for him. God is infinitely great, but our praise could be even greater than it is. More often, more heartfelt, more worshipful. Lord, help me to have great praise for a great, great God. He's to be feared above all gods. There are no other gods, but there are really gods of our own making, aren't they? For all the gods of the peoples are idols. I did some word search on idols. And the word idol means really nothing, weak, futile. Oh, I think that alcohol is going to help me to self-medicate. It's weak. It's futile. It's got a wicked side effect to destroy you and your families. Drugs, pornography, shopping sprees, overeating. Any attempt to self-medicate, that becomes an idol. And while the thing itself is dangerous, the practice is dangerous and addictive, and the devil is in that addiction, by the way, the greatest thing is that the worship goes not to God, but to that thing. The money goes not to God, but to that thing. And that's the real sin. So when you're asking God to heal you of a certain addiction, shall we call it, uh, ask for forgiveness that we've made that thing our idol, Instead of God. And does that thing take you away from the Lord? Mm. That's the real question. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if that thing takes you away from the Lord, mm. then that thing is an idol. That's how you know. That's interesting, yeah. Let's, let's imagine, let's go out and get really stinking drunk and have a Bible study and praise and worship chorus. Let's get on pornography and also be worshiping the Lord at the same time. Let's get into drug addiction and heroin and just be blessing and praising God. You can't do both. You can't do the same thing. Let's get into overeating and just indulge ourselves and just be blessing God and have a Bible study. No, you cannot, you don't, uh, you, 
The Lord said you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve idols and God itself. You know what the Jews say? Um, they say moderation. Moderation. And really, if anything that's over moderated, you know, too much. Everything in moderation. And everything in moderation. I, right. I, I tweak that a little. I, so I don't say everything. I say almost everything. Everything in moderation. <laughs> There's some things that <laughs> I don't want. <laughs> and uh, if you have trouble eating, um, I can recommend uh, kosher food. My mother and father were in a uh, assisted living and it was kosher. And boy, the rabbi was right there to supervise the kitchen. And I ate meals every night there for about a year. And you you lost, will yeah. not overeat on kosher food. Now, it's, it makes a lot of sense biblically and even uh, health-wise to drain all the blood out of, of meat. But that blood is really the juice and uh, the flavor, etc. cetera. And uh, so if you want to lose some weight, eat a kosher diet. You will be moderate. Every one of those Jewish people in that home were slim. Uh, they were small in stature in many cases, but slim. They probably lived to be 100 million years old. They just, uh, in any event, everything in moderation. But, well, the Bible uh, says that the life is in the blood. That's right. Everything, but give the glory to God. Everything to him. So we look at the fact that idols are empty. If there's an idol in your life, it's empty. What's it doing for you? And when does that thing give you up? I'm not going to try to break this addictive habit, but it'll give me up. It will when you die. Mm -hmm. When you die, then you'll stop. My, my, my biological father was an alcoholic all his life, and that's what broke the marriage up. I asked my stepsister, who is in Tennessee, and she was raised by him, and I said, when did, uh, when did he uh, stop drinking? She said, at 87, the day he died. That's when he stopped drinking. He so, gave his heart to the Lord. But some people are still, they give their heart to the Lord, and it's hard for us to understand, but they still battle that addiction. That's right. That that's doesn't right. mean they're not saved. There are some, now they, of course, you know, it, it does say the fruit and all that, but I do believe some people are saved, and yet the addiction that's right. sometimes, I don't know, maybe they lose the reward, I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't know. So what does your addiction do for you? Nothing but destroy you. What about the Lord, what's he do for you? He made the heavens, verse five. Honor and majesty are before him. He has honor, he has majesty. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Now those are two very desirable qualities, strength and beauty. Mm, and where, in, are they, where are they they're found? They're in his sanctuary. In his sanctuary, in his presence. Do you want to find strength and beauty? Now we all want to have physical strength and we want to be beautiful if we can, but the real strength and beauty is going to be in his sanctuary. Kelly and I were walking the dogs this morning at a, at a park nearby, and uh, all these wonderful young people were running and jogging and doing push-ups, and I, there must have been 50, 75 of them oh, there. more. More than maybe 100. And so I said to one of the uh, uh, older ladies, I said, what's the motivation? What's getting these kids out here at 9 o'clock in the morning, just running and setting their watches and running in groups, three here, five there, 10 there? And she said it's the, uh, the cross-country team at uh, Bethlehem Central. And uh, these kids are getting themselves strong and, and beautiful. They're all about 15, 16, 17. Uh, and I thought, well, that's wonderful, and that's good. And we should all be taking a lesson from that, not just stop when you're uh, in high school. But then I thought about the strength and beauty that we should go through for a lifetime in the Lord, and that is in His Word. Get into his word, and as you get into his word, you're going to get younger, Paul says, more beautiful, stronger. You're going to be renewed day by day. So as those young people were very diligent, and I'm talking about they were running. I pulled into the park around quarter to nine, and I left around 9.30. They were still running. And so they, it was a long, long time. Get into God's word. Put that effort into your spiritual strength and beauty. You're going to see the Lord right there with you, and people are going to notice it. They're going to notice how strong you are in him, how beautiful you are in him. Well, verse 7. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So how do you give to the Lord glory and strength. I can't give that to him. He has that. But it really means to ascribe, to acknowledge. Lord, you have all the glory. You have all the strength. 
and I'm going to bring an offering into your courts in honor of you. I'm going to honor you, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to help you with your program. And what is your program? According to Jesus, get the good news out. That's the program. My mother, Verna, always stayed focused. She had a very focused mentality. She put blinders on, didn't get sidetracked. And once the Lord called her into ministry, she had one mission, and that was get the word out. Get the word out no matter what the cost. I'd come home upset about situations in the church and people and what have you. She says, don't get distracted. Just get the word out, honey. Just get the word out. And that was her mission until the day she passed. And that's our mission as well. Just get God's word out. That's what he's saying here. Tell everybody about Jesus. And bring an offering. Bring the offering of money. More importantly, bring the offering of yourself. Put yourself into that offering plate. Picture, if you will, as the offering plate is there. Take it off the stand. Put it on the floor. And metaphorically, step in the offering plate. And say, Lord, I'm giving you myself. Here I am. Well, let's tell the nations about the Lord. Verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. So tell the nations, tell the people, tell the Gentiles, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Tell them. Talk about him in a restaurant. Gossip about him, how great God is. People are going to listen to you. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Well, when is that going to take place? So, all scripture is profitable. So it can take place any time, but this means... Uh, what were they talking about here? The millennium, right? That's right. The coming judgment. Yeah. He's talking about the Lord returning. Now, the Lord does judge all the time. But the judgment's going to take place when the Lord returns. We know from prophecy that the Lord's going to catch the church up in what we know is the, is the rapture. And then he's going to come to earth at the end of the tribulation with his saints and uh, set up thrones of judgment. And we, he's going to judge the nations to see who's allowed to come on into the millennium, believers, Jews and Gentiles. We were talking this morning as we were brushing our teeth, we were talking about amillennialism of all things. And we were talking about the, we don't get into different theories about the Lord's return, but amillennialism is a very interesting one, which uh, some very intelligent, bright people have believed in. And amillennialism believes that really you're in the millennium right now. There is no literal thousand years. And so um, as far as the uh, amillennialists are concerned, right now Satan is bound in the pit and he's not operating. As my old mentor teacher once said, if that's true, Chuck Smith said, if Satan is bound, as far as I'm concerned, his chain is a little bit too long. <laughs> no, he's not bound yet for sure. And the Lord is going to return. And incidentally, none of us want to promote anti-Semitism or anti-anyism. But I'll tell you, the most anti-Semitic thing you can ever say or believe in is amillennialism. Because the Jews are looking forward to the millennium when God is going to bless them and bless the world through them. All those promises in the Old Testament about blessing are for Israel. And to say it's not going to take place. There is no future for you, Israel. You're not going to reign with Christ. You're not going to be redeemed. Paul, you were wrong in Romans to say that all Israel is going to be saved. Because it's the church who gets all those blessings. And the millennialism is now here there's no hope for Israel. People, but, you take that hope from them. How anti-Semitic is that? It's a horrible, pernicious doctrine. And I don't get into bashing other doctrines. But there's nothing more anti-Semitic. But it's not right. Or it, untrue than no millennium. There'll be a millennium. And believers are going to be here in their resurrection bodies, ruling and reigning with Christ. So we're looking forward. That's when he's going to judge, by the way. So next time you see an amillennialist, say, Jesus loves you and so do I. And as J. Vernon McGee would say, on the way up in the rapture, you'll find out that I was right all along. See you in the millennium. So, uh, and then smile and love them. All right, verse 11 and 12 and 13. Let's close it out. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. 
Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. That's what he will do in the millennium. <clears throat> and that's what he wants to do right Boy, now. Boy, is that pertinent for now? In huh? you and me. He's going to judge. Judgment begins where? The house of the Lord. So let's say, Lord, let's start right here tonight. Lord, judge Kelly and Jerry. Put your name in there. And say, Lord, search me and know my heart. As King David said, Psalm 139, Search the closing me and know verse. My heart, oh Lord. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any, any wicked, wicked way in me. Of me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, let your judgment start with me. Judge me. Show me where I'm wrong so I can repent of it. He'll probably show me on the, as soon as I step out the door after praying that. <laughs> He's always faithful <laughs> He's gonna judge to me reveal and, something to me. He's going to judge me well, and say, Well, Kelly, you remember that person that you didn't <laughs> like last week? You need to repent. And he'll say to me, be nicer to your wife. And she'll say, amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's You're pray. always <laughs> nice to me. Well, most of the time. Oh, all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> judge her for that, Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you all the glory and honor. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us now and bless all those who have come out tonight. May they be strengthened through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Until the next time, shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Passing by this moment, your needs to sound.